Recorded, then we have to have a modicum of decorum. <laughs> I'd like to talk about the origin of iron rich ultramafic pegmatite bodies in the Bushveld complex, and for a large portion of this talk, um, it is thanks to um, the Lonplatz Mining Company who provided access and to um, Andy Vituza who was our um, honor student from there which enabled us to get some of these um, extremely valuable photographs and build up our interpretation. <coughs> so this is the face of a, an open pit um, which is overlying the upper group to chromatite layer. The chromatite layer will not be visible in any of these photographs, but this is the package in between the UG2 chromatite layer and the Marensky reef. Now, what are iron-rich ultramafic pegmatites, which I'll be referring to as IRAPs from now on? They're rocks dominated by clinopyroxene, olivine, and magnetite. It is claimed they contain minimal plagioclase, but see later. And they cut the layered succession irregularly, but usually with very sharp contacts. There's <coughs> another photograph of the open pit um, showing in places what are almost regular sills and dikes but in other places, they can be highly irregular bodies. Here is a close-up, getting closer to some of these, which would appear fairly regular with a vertical dike and a horizontal sill. The, the core of it is made up of olivine and clinopyroxene, giving whirlite, uh, and a rim which is darker colored of clinopyroxenite. These rocks are very, very, um, well, not quite monomineralic, but they have a limited number of minerals in them. <clears throat> and they have a very unusual bulk composition. <clears throat> Notice this offshoot here has a fairly regular planar base, but a much more irregular upper surface to which I'll refer later. There's a lot of debate about these, but there's one thing that seems to be generally accepted, and that is that they formed by replacement. These aren't disruptive in any way. And one rather neat example is visible here. Here we have the layered succession of norite and anorthosite. <coughs> Below the, bush, below the Marensky Reef, there's a very, very distinctive 
horizon referred to as the boulder bed. And you can see here in the normal stratigraphy, in these leucocratic rocks, there is a layer with these um, elliptical bodies which are pyroxenite, um, and that is what is referred to as the boulder bed. Now, if we trace that into the zone of replacement, you can see at exactly the same horizon, we have here a boulder that, whereas this particular body may appear to be totally fragmented <coughs> and displaced, it is not. The surrounding material has been perfectly replaced, but we suggest the geometry of this block is still coherent with the original layer of the boulder bed. <clears throat> so it is replacement, not displacement. <clears throat> now they're called IRUPS, the U standing for ultramafic, but how ultramafic are they? Now here is an example of one of these bodies, and as you can see it has um, elongated clinopyroxenes growing upwards, but a large proportion of plagioclase um, in its upper half. Here is an even more spectacular body of a non-ultramafic IRUP. Um, here we have the UG2 chromatite layer. The foot wall is an orthozite, and the two are cross-cut by this quite leucocratic body, which you can see here. If we move to a close-up of that same body, here is the UG2 chromatite, and we can see here um, a rock which is more than 50% plagioclase. So the idea that they are purely ultramafic is something of an oversimplification. I'll come back to that point later. <coughs> here we have the rocks overlying the UG2 chromatite layer. This is a pyroxenite and the discordant body going through here, you can see has a significant amount of plagioclase in it. It is not ultramafic. So those are pictures, courtesy of Lon Platts, that allow us to look and think in a bit more detail about the different hypotheses. Now there are three fundamental um, hypotheses. One, uh, that they are of hydrothermal origin, a chloride-rich um, fluid uh, generated from somewhere, um, altering the rocks. <clears throat> a second group, which are called downers, um, they were the I well, these, which can be divided into two um, subgroups. There's the idea of an immiscible iron-rich liquid from the upper zone penetrating downward, and then a, a revised version of that. Um, that in fact there is disequilibrium, partial melting of an orthozite which produces an iron-rich liquid, but again that iron-rich liquid um, intrudes downwards. And then we have the um, uppers model which envisages an injection of a new magma from below. <coughs> So how do we resolve these different ideas? I thought until recently that the idea of a fluid had gradually died a death, but it has uh, reappeared its, uh, its head in a recent paper. Um, so we, we need to look at that model. And let me talk about fluids for a minute. If we go back 90 years to Norman Levy Bowen, I'm sure a name you've all heard of, in his textbook, he wrote, to many petrologists, a volatile component is exactly like Maxwell's demon. It does just what one would wish it to do. Now, 90 years ago, um, we, we need to sort of think about what people viewed in those days. And what was Maxwell's demon? Well, Maxwell in 1867 um, was at the development of thermodynamics. And he um, was, there were several laws which were being proposed. And he used a, a thought experiment 
um, to try and demonstrate what some people were claiming and was clearly impossible. And so Maxwell uh, had this thought experiment that said, a demon controls a trapdoor between two chambers of gas. As individual molecules approach the trapdoor, the demon either opens or shuts the door such that fast-moving molecules only pass in one direction and slow-moving molecules only pass the other way. It was his attempt to show how some ridiculous ideas about heat transfer were totally impossible. So, regarding IRUPs, um, the fluids would add or remove exactly the desired or the undesired elements to make the new mineral assemblage. So it wasn't molecules of gas, but it was um, other elements and species that somehow got through these trapdoors. So let's have a look at this question of fluids in relation to what we can see in this field outcrop. Now we know that aluminium and titanium are the most difficult major oxides to move by fluids. And bauxite is a, an excellent example how you can remove everything else from a rock but aluminium stays behind and you end up with bauxite deposits. Yet a pure anorthosite here is allegedly replaced to produce an ultramafic rock. So let's look at some numbers. The anorthosite here contains 30% Al203. The ultramafic rock typically contains about 3% Al203. So 27% of aluminium has rather conveniently disappeared from this um, equation. Let's look at it the other way around. The titanium content of the anorthosite is about 0.3%. When we look at the ultramafic body, it contains 2 to 4% TiO2. So somehow, titanium um, has been added to the system. So titanium and aluminium have been redistributed in enormous proportions, despite being the most immobile of major elements. So how does a fluid achieve that? So let's go back to Maxwell's demon. Here's a vertical example, and we have anorthosite rocks. <clears throat> Titanium, derived from places unknown, enters into this system in a fluid. So trapdoor one opens. Titanium penetrates through and forms the magnetite um, and titanium-rich clinopyroxenes. And the aluminium is dissolved into this fluid to produce a whirlite, olivine, clinopyroxene, and magnetite. Then a second trapdoor opens, and the aluminium escapes in some form and is deposited at places unknown. We don't have any aluminium rich rocks apart from plagioclase anywhere in the Bushveld complex. So that's Maxwell's demon applied to a fluid causing these uh, mineralogical changes. I personally feel that it's totally implausible. So let's move on to the second hypothesis uh, which was developed by Maurice Villeneuve and Roger Schoon and Andrew Mitchell. They began by postulating there were two totally discrete types of discordant bodies. There was magnesium dunite, and that was then placed upwards, and then there was the iron-rich whirlite, the irups, that was then placed downward. I want to focus first on the, the irups, but then come back briefly to the magnesium dunite. Now, let's actually look at a map of the distribution of these irups. And this is taken from the Amandelbolt Platinum Mine in the northwestern Bushveld, um, published by Maurice Villeurne and, and colleagues. And you can see these black blobs are the olivine clinopyroxene pegmatites, the irups. And I want to focus on that one first. You can see that it is of very considerable size. It's two kilometers in diameter. 
That is a massive amount of ma material um, that one has to consider. And there are a lot of smaller uh, bodies, but let's just bear in mind that these things can be two kilometers in size. Now let's look at the model that was developed by Roger Schoon and Andrew Mitchell. Um, they had various magmas circulating which somehow produced an immiscible liquid, little black dots here which were iron rich and then somehow um, they penetrated downward um, to their present position. So we have downward emplacement of a dense iron rich liquid. Something in the order of two kilometers in diameter and a very considerable depth. Now, one of the biggest problems in my mind is how do you get rid of the pre-existing material? Somehow, as a liquid is trying to penetrate its way downwards, you have to melt, display, somehow get rid of the existing material, presumably back out the spout. I have great difficulty with how one can do that. Two kilometers in diameter and unknown vertical extent is a huge amount of material that has somehow got to be displaced. Now let's look at the spacing of these bodies. Um, because this is a mining area, uh, we know exactly where all of these bodies are. And um, it is not due to poor outcrop whatsoever, but they are well known. And we can see that there are um, linear extents, which can be up to three kilometers in extent with no ultramafic bodies. So there's one body, there's a second body, three kilometers apart. So how does this very dense liquid, which is shown here, percolate horizontally for a great distance before it decides to go downward. Surely a dense liquid, wherever it formed, would try and penetrate downward. <clears throat> now let's look at two different scales um, to look at this problem of downward displacement. This one which I've shown you before. If we look at a blow up of this area here, you can see that we've got a relatively planar base to this body but the upper contact is highly irregular. That to me doesn't look like it's trying to go downwards. Um, if anything, whatever is happening, it's growing upwards. And then here we have the base of the main magnetite layer in the upper zone. Uh, we can see an anorthosite foot wall, the massive magnetite layer with an extremely sharp contact. Now, if we had liquid emissibility um, of an iron-rich liquid, such a dense iron-rich liquid would percolate down into the underlying plagioclase crystal mush. It would have to penetrate three kilometers downward and displace what was there to produce these ira bodies if it was due to downward penetration. So for all these different reasons, I query whether these things can penetrate downwards. Now, a slightly different model um, was presented by Roger Schoon. Um, he envisaged melting of gabbro to leave a residue of an orthosite and an iron-rich liquid, and then that iron-rich liquid penetrated downward. It's based on a model from the Skergard um, intrusion where the injection of the basistop and sheet into the scare guard intrusion caused a very small amount of uh, partial melt which was of a ferro-gabroic composition. Gabroic, not ultramafic. Uh, but that was a few centimeters to meters in size. We see no comparable features in the bushveld of the appropriate residual rocks for this model to have occurred in the bush fault, and yet here it's on a scale which is hundreds of times bigger than seen in Skergard. So I query the downward injection model. 
So alternatively, we suggest that these magmas were emplaced upward. They replaced olivine and orthopyrox. Sorry, they replaced plagioclase and orthopyroxene with olivine and clinopyroxene. These magmas percolated upward, just like a volcano that creates a vertical conduit for itself. There is one big difference. A volcano is emplaced through brittle rocks. These irups intruded into hot plastic host rocks when instead of breaking apart the stratigraphy, um, the existing material was melted, assimilated, flushed out through the top of the volcano, in inverted commas. So now we must ask, what kind of magmas were they that were um, injected and produced this change in mineralogy? <coughs> now here in this uh, rather difficult to view picture is the pyroxene quadrilateral. shows the compositions of uh, minerals produced in tholeitic magmas. If we look at this area up near the clinopyroxene corner um, and expand it, we can see the curve which we normally get for pyroxenes which are of tholeitic compositions. All the clinopyroxenes in the irups are very, very calcium rich. So these dot, solid dots, open dots, crosses, whatever, are different um, compositions from different studies. Uh, the black dots are those from um, our study. There are no orthopyroxenes in these irups, and so we conclude that these clinopyroxenes are formed from an alkaline magma. <clears throat> so now let me come on to this issue of the two directions which um, Schoon and others proposed, upward for dunite, downward for irups. Um, here is a composite going through the lower critical and main zones of the Bushveld complex, showing the Mg number of pyroxenes and olivines. There aren't a lot of data for the olivines, which are shown by the squares and rectangles. There are a lot more data for the clinopyroxenes, which are shown by circles and ellipses. But what one can see, especially for the clinopyroxenes, is that one can have clinopyroxenes, which have an Mg number of 85 and more. Those are very, very magnesium-rich compositions. And there is a continuum all the way through to more iron-rich. So there is a continuum. Oh, a lot of these are not iron-rich. If we look at the 50% line, a very large proportion of these compositions are relatively magnesium-rich. They're not all iron-rich. And there seems to be a continuum of compositions um, from the, the dunites and magnesium-rich compositions right through to more iron-rich. So there is a continuum, not two distinct groups. <clears throat> now what is important about this magma is that it crystallizes olivine and clinopyroxene before plagioclase. Most basaltic magmas crystallize plagioclase before clinopyroxene. So there's a slight reversal in composition. But I showed you pictures um, of these discordant bodies which weren't ultramafic. Some of them were quite plagioclase rich. And if we look at this um, um, compilation of data of what are called IRUPs by Schoon and Mitchell, here we have a vertical section. Here is the Morensky Reef. Down here we have the critical zone. Up here we have the main zone. And what we find is if we look at these bulk rock compositions for aluminium, then we can find that they tend to be fairly ultramafic, 5% aluminium, low down. But then they become much more aluminium rich. They have 10 to 
aluminium in them when you go into the main zone. So these are not all ultramafic, they are simply ultramafic low down, and as the magma differentiates, it then, come on, move you, how do we move this, there we go, the plagioclase content increases. So in fact, they are crystallizing plagioclase, but in the order of olivine, clinopyroxene, and then plagioclase, and um, producing these gabroic pegmatitic bodies cutting through the main zone. They're not all ultramafic. Now, what kind of magma crystallizes that order? Well, if one looks at one's petrography textbooks, one finds that ancaramites are defined by the crystallization order of olivine, clinopyroxene, and then plagioclase. <coughs> A lot of basaltic rocks, if you look carefully at their petrography, ought to be defined as ancaramites, but people tend to ignore it and just call them all basalts. Now, what's special about that composition to produce that crystallization order? If we look at the calcium to aluminium ratio, now, um, clinopyroxene contains only calcium. Plagioclase contains both calcium and aluminium. If we have a calcium-aluminium ratio greater than unity, there's a lot more calcium than aluminium, and so clinopyroxene forms first. If there's a lower ratio, which is what most basaltic rocks have, there's a lot more aluminium, and so plagioclase crystallizes before clinopyroxene. So we need a magma with a relatively high calcium-aluminium ratio. We call them ancaramites. And in fact, these are a lot more common than reading the literature would lead you to believe. They occur in basically all large igneous provinces. In the Karoo in South Africa, we don't have many, but in the Antarctica part of the um, Karoo province, there are many ancaramites. They occur in the Siberia and the Deccan and the North Atlantic large igneous provinces. So that's the kind of magma that would produce um, the right kind of crystallization order. So what can I conclude about iron-rich ultramafic pegmatites. Well, first of all, they're not all iron-rich. They're not all ultramafic. The Danites and the Irups are not two different suites, but a continuum of intrusive bodies. I don't believe the Irups were emplaced downward and the IROPs were not derived from within the main Bushveldt magma chamber. And they formed from a rather alkaline basaltic magma. So is there any other way we can decide which of these is the most plausible processes? Now, Race Latipov um, kept asking me um, about other examples. And he was saying, why are they totally restricted to the mafic rocks of the Bushveld complex? If they're from a different magmatic suite, why don't we see them elsewhere? If they are totally restricted to the Bushveld complex, that might argue for an internal genesis. And Race Latipov had a valid point. It has taken me many years to realize that the answer was given in 1975. Ever since I came here, the answer's been waiting uh, for us to find. There was a paper written in 2008. A bushveld related high titanium igneous suite derived from an alkali to transitional basaltic magma in South Africa published by Sabrant Duval and colleagues 10 years ago. And here we have the Bushveld complex. There's Johannesburg and Pretoria, the Bushveld around here. And all of these little black dots are these 
transition alkali to transitional basaltic magmas. Let me blow up this area here south of Johannesburg. So there's Johannesburg. So we're now looking southward towards the Vredefort Dome. And there's a very interesting intrusion here called Skurngesicht. <clears throat> this map is pretty illegible. Um, there are only a couple of things I want to mention. Um, it was published by um, Nock Frick from the Geological Survey, as I say, 43 years ago. <clears throat> it's a body which is about a kilometer in extent and half a kilometer that way. That's IRA size. Um, you can't see what all the different rock types are. Um, but they drilled into this because it had a lot of magnetite, which they were looking at for its vanadium content. So they drilled boreholes and they produced a cross section. And first of all, the country rocks with a V are the Ventersdorp lavas. And these boreholes intersected the following rock types. Frigg said the whole of that complex is dominated by magnetite clinopyroxenite, 24% magnetite, magnetite dunite, 35% magnetite, magnetite whirlite, 22% magnetite, and magnetitites. And because they had a lot of borehole information, they were able to conclude that a regular succession of rock types does not exist. This isn't a layered complex. This is a chaotic melange of these olivine, clinopyroxene, magnetite-rich rocks. So they had six boreholes, 100 kilometers deep. So they had a, a pretty good three-dimensional picture of at least 100 meters of this complex. Well, when I look at that, to me, that is an IRAP. It intruded from below into the Ventersdorp lavas more than 100 kilometers away from the present Bushveld complex. So I think I've been able to find an example that answers Reis Latipov's very reasonable question and challenge about distribution. <clears throat> Let's just have a look at the clinopyroxenes in this intrusion. They were analyzed by Nock Frick. These are the pyroxenes in the Skurngesicht intrusion. As you can see, we've got this limit of clinopyroxene composition for foliatic magmas. The Skurngesicht clinopyroxene are much more calcium rich. And here we have the data set that I showed you for IRUPS. So, Duval et al. said that Skurngesicht was derived from a an alkaline magma, I suggest that these IRUPs are also derived from an alkaline magma. <clears throat> so, to conclude, I suggest that an IRUP is formed by intrusion of large volumes of alkaline magma from below that melted and replaced the still hot layered succession of the Bushveld complex. Thank you. That's an interesting <laughs> question. Um, there we have clinopyroxenite, which don't have any magnetite in them, um, and they are very magnesium. Um, there is magnetite, but it's associated with 
carbonatite at Palabora, and we don't see any evidence for carbonatites in the IRAPs. So um, it's an interesting thought. I'll think more about it, but my initial reaction would be that perhaps not the alkali. Yeah, the phosphorite still has quite a lot of um, carbonate. It also has a lot of appetite. Yeah. So there are two minerals that are in abundance at Palabora and are absent. But it, um, uh, given that the, the bushveld and the Palabora are the same age, um, the, the idea of an alkaline sweet um, maybe extends that far northwest, north, northeast. Mm -hmm. Well, as I, as I mentioned, these ankaramites occur with all, layer, uh, with all large igneous provinces. Um, so it, it doesn't seem to be something that's unique to the, the bushveld. And in terms of guessing what the tectonic setting um, was for um, the bushveld, my only, my only comment would be that there is one downer involved, and that's the meteorite impact. <laughs> And a similar kind of question, I was just going to ask yeah. you what you think the, the source of these magnets are. So, kind of follow up on Jude's question. Is it just part of a sequence of yeah. magma generation Tradition. within a plume, or in your case, a meteorite? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, that's typical of a large igneous complex. Um, the, the melting processes that go on, why we should have a second stage of melting that is alkaline. In affinity, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, I don't try and pretend I understand the mantle. I can't understand the bush fault. So, uh. And you never see them cross-cutting the upper zone? You, you see, yeah, you do, yeah. yes. Well, in, in fact, they tend to become more magnetite-rich, and then we have the, uh, the magnetite plugs. Um, so they, they go right the way through to the, virtually to the top. We never see them cutting the granite so it would imply that they are possibly um, older than the, the granite, which again argues that they intruded while the bush, the mafic rocks were still very hot and plastic and remeltable. Oh, I don't know how we would find evidence for, for that. Um, maybe the seismic evidence is the fact that the rocks are, bro are broken to facilitate upward emplacement of the alkali basaltic magma. But, um, No, Paul would tell you that's exactly what has happened. Is that right, Paul? Not in this particular No, no, I'm talking about the, the, anorth the, the anorthosites that cut the chromite layer at Dwarfs River, about which you wrote a paper. Yeah. So there we, we do have evidence of seismic activity um, in, well, we, we interpret some kind of rapid, brief, violent um, disturbance of the stratigraphy. Yeah, um, yeah. But we don't actually see um, an IRAP going through those things at Dwarfs River. But the, the principle is there, that we do have evidence of shock deformation. And I think as both you and I believe, um, shock waves can induce crystallization to produce certain kinds of layering. Okay. 
When I first came to Tovitz, the Karoo, uh, the Stormberg lavas um, took about 40 million years to be erupted. Um, and people thought that igneous events were, you know, many millions of years in their duration. What Theo Walraven and I were able to calculate was that the magma to the bushveld was then placed in 65,000 years. And in fact, I'm rather gratified to see that over time, all of these large uh, layered and um, large in large igneous bodies, the time scale is getting less and less and less and less and less, and people are now talking about well under a million years. They say the, the lavas of the Karoo were in place possibly within half a million years. So when we were being dramatic and talking about 65,000 years, everybody now is moving their time scale in that direction. So yeah, we were talking about 65,000 years for emplacement of the magma up to the level of the pyroxenite marker, then a total of um, 200,000 years for the final crystallization of the magma, and then as Sue Webb and I have shown, it then took another half a million years for the whole intrusion to go below its Curie temperature, and we know from the paleomagnetic data that the, the layered rocks of the bushveld crystallized horizontally through their Curie temperature. So that was between half a million and a million years before it sagged. So those are the kind of time scales that I like to think about for the bushveld. Well, we've got half a million. Yeah, I'd say a few hundred thousand to a maximum of half a million years, maybe less. I, yeah, um, Reis Latipov apparently took a large amount of IRA from the, the Tweerfontein pipe, which is up near Steelport, I'm sure a lot of people know it, and they couldn't get any zircons out of it. They couldn't find any zircons. Um, I thought, let's go down to Skungsicht um, and see if we can get any zircons out of it. So I was talking to uh, Marlena Elberg um, at the weekend, and I said, what do you think about doing that, Marlena? And she said, well, if it's an alkaline magma, um, alkaline magmas can dissolve a lot more zirconium before they precipitate zircon. Therefore, the chance of getting zircon is fairly remote, and that's why race didn't find any. So uh, we haven't pursued the idea of trying to get zircons out of Skungesicht. So did you have a question? Yeah, I, I just no. wanted to mm. ask about the, the magnetite. You said it, mm. they often get more magnetite rich um, mm -hmm. higher up. Are there any lateral variations that are systematic? In composition, do you mean? Or Amount of There are huge lateral variations in the amount of magnetite plugs. In the Steelport Valley, there are a huge number of magnetite plugs. But then um, other parts of the eastern bushveld have got no plugs at all. Around the western bushveld, the plugs are very, very erratically distributed. And I think, maybe Judith and Paul can correct me, but I don't think there are any magnetite plugs in the northern limb. Not that anyone's identified Yeah, yeah. So their distribution is extremely irregular, which is one of the reasons why I don't think it's downward trickling of magmas. Because if it was downward trickling of magmas, then we'd expect to find them everywhere where there's say, the upper zone or the main zone of the bushveld, and they're not. I'm going to take two uh, questions, one, the first one from Peter and then the last one from Marina. Mm -hmm. Peter. Mm -hmm. How did of make composition of this ultramedicated rock? We haven't analyzed them. Um, so I, 
I can't comment, I'm afraid. Well, the, the, the problem is, yeah, the problem is they are pure cumulants. They're not trapped, they're, they're not liquids. These are pure cumulants from magma flowing through. They've dissolved plagioclase and orthopyroxene and they've precipitated um, clinopyroxene and olivine. So they are cumulus. And for example, they've got less than 0.1% P2O5. They've got less than 0.3% K2O. But that's because they're cumulates, they're not liquids. But their clinopyroxene show that they are of alkaline. Like no, they, it's, um, it's like um, hard water flowing through a pipe. Okay, you have a liquid water flowing through, it precipitates calcium carbonate around the edge, and the remaining water just flows out. And that's what we believe happened, or I'll claim responsibility. What I believe um, was happening, that this magma comes in, it's a liquid, it's out of equilibrium with the orthopyroxene and the plagioclase, and so it dissolves it and precipitates the olivine and clinopyroxene in its place. So it's not a, a mush that is coming in. Okay, well, my next week's speaker has just disappeared out of the door. <laughs> <laughs>